special guest we have. It's Callum. Uh, Callum won a giveaway on Twitter uh, about the World Series of Poker main event. Who would be the last man standing? We had, I think, 950 entrants. And Callum guessed the last man standing would be Jack Oliver from the UK. Uh, I was secretly hoping that Jack would go further, being a UK young online grinder, someone who I could uh, resonate with a little bit. And uh, fortunately for Callum, he got there. And uh, the prize of winning was um, a 5k seat to the millions online on party next month. But also it was going to be a session with me. We were hoping it was going to be somebody who'd never played poker before. But fortunately, uh, or unfortunately, however you look at it, Callum is a, a crusher in his own right. Uh, he comes from a cash game background. He plays 100 now, does very well. So uh, what we're going to do today is we're going to go through... Uh, a hand history he played less than one week ago where he final tabled. We're hopefully going to learn a little bit from him about how he approaches the early phases and then hopefully I can give some kind of insight on how the final table looks too. Uh, so yeah, Callum, good to have you here. Uh, do you want to introduce yourself? Tell us a little bit more about you. Uh, yep, glad to be aboard. Um, I've been playing poker seriously for just over a year. Um, basically exactly a year at this point. Um, I've been like noodling around for a couple of years before that, but only taking it seriously. And um, I'm almost entirely play cash. Occasionally, I'll play a big live tournament. I very, very rarely play online tournaments. Um, so yeah, I'm going to be good in the early stages and probably awful in the later stages. Okay, cool. So the software we use today is called. Check Decide. Check Decide is a really good tool. Don't worry, I'm not affiliated. I'm not trying to get money or anything. Just a tool which I genuinely use myself. You can put a hand history in and go through it really, really easily. It looks very good. And for stuff like coaching courses and calls and YouTube videos, I think it's really good. What we're going to do is I'm going to go through as many hands as possible in the early phase, maybe 20, 30. I'm going to ask Callum's thoughts why he did what he did, uh, give my input a little bit. And then hopefully we can accelerate through too. So I'm just going to go through and kind of narrate the tournament. So kind of an interesting one straight away. This is a very trashy hand in the big blind, a hand which cash game players would definitely fold normally. In a tournament, you get a very good price because you have antis, there's more players in, uh, you, get, you play wider ranges. Uh, I guess, Callum, this is unusual for you to even contemplate defending. Uh, what's your kind of thoughts? Funnily enough, like one of the things I've always had as a cash player is just defending in the big blind way too much. <laughs> so, um, but I, I, I mean, it's just like this kind of hand is not like it's like the, when you have like queen two offsuit, queen three offsuit, jack three offsuit, ten four offsuit are not the kind of ones I would look to like defend overly wide. So I think I fold this, but I mean, maybe I couldn't. I, I would consider this quite borderline. So if this is like a slam dunk defend, that's interesting. Yes, yeah, so I would typically defend here against uh, weaker players, just we get a very good price. We will realize lots of equity. Weaker players typically won't put big bets in with uh, lots of their range, and also they will very often miss range C bets. So like, let's say the board comes something like Queen 9 4. If they have a hand like Ace Deuce, they'll very often check or just play very passively. So you get to realize a lot more equity in tournaments because people are missing kind of range C bets, especially weaker players. However, it's one of those hands where it doesn't really matter either way. Uh, I hope this um, video won't be one of those videos where I'm like, oh, it doesn't really matter what you do, but it's one of those where typically it's not gonna matter either way, but let's uh, let's go in. I would go for a fold, but we're gonna see what you do. You do fold. Uh, next hand is pocket fives. It goes raising call, comes to you. Uh, any consider what are you thinking? I think I'm just always calling here when we're deep enough here. Um, this one seems like a very easy hand to call. Is there any hands here which uh, you'd maybe feel like, oh, I'm not sure what to do here? Or what would your approach be here with like, all the hands that you get here with? I think stuff like um, probably some of the worst suited broadways and worst suited aces, stuff like a7 suited, queen 10 suited. I'd be in two minds worth call or raise in a tournament. In a cash game, you can't consider, right? Um, so yeah, it's just just like the worst suit, and, and even stuff like I guess like like uh, like Jack Nine suit and stuff. 
just those kind of like junky Broadway suited hands and junky suited aces. I think if I had nines, nines, tens is probably as well. T tens I would definitely three, but nines kind of on the cusp. Sure. So one thing I'd say here straight away is that it's flex. You know, this is probably something you won't see as much in cash games. You, you'll see just lots of different sizes. So the first guy who raised uh, in the first time we looked at, and the, the last time basically you played, he went to 2x. This guy's now going to 4x. So straight away in tournaments, we can see there's lots of randomness, right? People do random things. When you're playing this tournament, this 5k tournament uh, next month, uh, in, in just a couple of weeks, at your table, you're probably going to have a contrast between like some people with say $10 million in earnings and some people who've maybe gone into the tournament for $1, $5, $10. So kind of marking people as players who are kind of maybe pros and players who are weak is going to be quite important because in tournaments, you make a lot of money off the weak players, like probably this these, these guys playing here, these Forex. And the guys who play kind of standard, even if you play well yourself, you'll never make too much against them. So kind of staying out of their way with the queen free uh, is going to be probably advisable and trying to get into as many pots as possible with the guys who are really blasting is going to be good. I think uh, against 4x, I w probably wouldn't free bet pocket 10s. I think against weaker players, you want to probably keep the SPR as high as possible because when you get 10s and the SPR gets to say 2 uh, or 3 or a relatively low SPR, you're almost forced to get the money in with a relatively low average equity when you're all in. Whereas when you keep the stacks really deep and the SPR really deep, let's say 10 to one or eight to one or 12 to one or 15 to one, um, you know, you can put in big raises and they'll be stationed too wide to what they should do versus these relative big bets. So typically I'm trying to keep the SPR as high as possible against these weaker players with anything marginal at all. Obviously when you get aces, kings, ace, king suited, you're trying to minimize the SPR, but even a hand like Jacks here, for example, there's almost as much EV in keeping the SPR as high as possible and trying to make sure that, that these guys, even the big blind could make a bad uh, big blind defend with say King eight offsuit and gets you know too much money in on certain boards, whatever it may be. Um, so yeah, I probably wouldn't free bet as wide as what you suggested there, especially- You'd probably like extend your call range just off like Ace Jack suited as well then. Exactly, exactly, yeah, because I feel like, um, you know, they don't know you, you don't know them. Uh, the difference between a cash game and a tournament is you, every spot you play, you're only going to play once against these exact opponents in your whole life. You know, you're never going to be playing 150 big blinds deep facing 4x or however deep you are facing a 4x raise from Zemo 99 ever again in your life. So if he does see that you have ace jack suited or whatever in your flat calling range or he doesn't know what your range looks like, um, then it doesn't matter, right? It's not like it's a high stakes tournament where it's the same 60 players where you have to really consider balance and consider how your range will look like and how they will exploit you in two months or three months. Playing a $5,000 tournament here, basically you get dealt a EV of your tournament of let's say around about 5,500, 5,700, whatever it is. And your goal is to make as much EV as possible in this one tournament. It's not to uh, make EV over, you know, 6,000 tournaments or whatever it be, especially coming from a cash game background, you can approach this as exploitatively as you want, because by the time Zamol works out how to exploit you, you'll be on a different table. You'll never play with him again. You'll be a different stack depth where you'll have a different strategy anyway. So, um, yeah, just important to approach every single spot as okay. I'm, I'm playing this exact spot. I'm not worrying about, you know, playing my entire range, let's say, um, yeah which is going to be very different to cash games, obviously. Um, let's go on. I guess you call and, oh, second. What was said there, I can't remember. Yeah. This is actually quite a, a weird time for a Yep. Yeah, so you flop a set, kind of interesting. So from the small- It's a pretty bad set. <laughs> yeah, it's a bad set, but against the guy who 4 x you know, typically... yeah, I'm very, I'm very comfortable against that guy. The, the button is kind of a bit concerning, but not you know you're not you're not worried you've got a set right. But yeah, button also will have every suited Broadway, so you'll have all Jack ten suited, Queen ten suited, all that kind of stuff. So straight away in this spot, uh, we're obviously thinking about how can we get ma max value. Um, what are your kind of considerations here? What are you, what are you hoping for? What's kind of like a a dream scenario for you in this kind of situation? 
I'm hoping the guy who raised four extra pots this fall with like queens. Well, if he just pots it, right, he's just going to have it most of the time. That's what I'm for. I don't want to see that guy check behind. I don't want to see. I don't want to see him min bet or him pot it and then the button raise. Um, but I mean, we're just. I guess we're just going with this here. It is we we can be easily set up set up this board. Um, the tens better because right? there's no straight available. Button might have three bet tens. Um, so we we don't like. I'm not trying to get out of having a set here, but yeah, I just want to see the like under the gun. The initial razor just make a big bet, and then we can just get the money in, and he's like drawn to two outs. That's what I'm hoping for. Yeah. Um. If if it was a slightly different board, like let's say, um. It, well, even on this board, actually, I don't think Leiden is that bad. Actually, um. If you think about how your range is constructed and how their range is constructed, you have a lot of pocket pairs. I think in your range, like you know, yeah. you have hands like five, six, or sevens, eights, nines, tens. Like you, you got you haven't really got like king queen offsuit or ace jack offsuit or offsuit hands, right? So you may have some super broadways, then you have lots of pocket pairs. Um, so for you, this board's actually pretty good. Lead-in is a potential consideration, especially exploitatively. Um, I think it's a kind of board texture where Zamol, like you said, will play quite honestly. Um, he won't, you won't get much EV out of Zamol bluffing this flop of say queen jack of diamonds and looking to blast off four way. Yeah, yeah. It's very likely he'll have an over pair and you'll play quite honestly. Or he'll have overcards and you'll play quite honestly. So against, let's just say against just Zamol, leading the flop is actually pretty good. Because let's say you lead for, let's just say third pot is your size in. Zamol will very often raise these over pairs for you anyway. So if he has a hand like jacks, queens, kings, or aces, he will very often fast play anyway. It also, yeah. um, it also will maybe encourage Zamol to stick around with a hand like ace, king of hearts, which will call the flop but wouldn't see bet the flop. It also maybe gets calls from Pro NL with his 10x, which may play, which will very likely play passive. If Pro NL has a hand like 10-9 suited, Jack 10 suited, it's very often, it's very likely that he's going to check back the flop, which is a bit of a disaster for pocket fives. The big blind also has a lot of straight draws, like 6-8, 8-9, eight, eight, Jack 8, Jack 9, and every suited 10, uh, every suited 7. So he's going to connect quite a lot too. So leading the flop, I actually think from the small blind here would be that would be what I would probably do because what you said about what you hope happens is that Zamol pots the flop and you can get it in. That doesn't really change when you lead the flop because when you lead the flop, yeah. Zamol's still going to probably blast it because he 4x pre-flop, right? He's a blaster. He's probably scared, you know, of, that your 10-9 is going to get there or something. Probably doesn't really understand how it looks like. So I would actually lead here with um, with pocket when five. You're, when you're, are, are you leading here purely for value in this kind of scenario? Like you're, you, are you are you leading here with like you know um, eight nine of spades? Yeah, but I also think leading with eight nine of spades is actually pretty good. You straight away knock out the big blind with some hands with let's say queen jack off or king jack off. You maybe get him to fold a five. Like if the big blind has a hand like king five suited and you lead nine eight, he's gonna have to fold because he has three people behind him. Uh, with under the gun, you get him to fold a hand like ace king of clubs, you know, so leading eight nine is pretty good then. You, you get him to fold ace eight of clubs, ace nine of clubs, like some hands which dominate you, etc. You get the button to fold some hands like pocket sixes, pocket fours, maybe even pocket eights, pocket nines fold when you lead, you know, obviously with nine eight, you'd block them heavily, but there's definitely some good stuff which can happen um, from leading some of your draws as well. Uh, it's actually quite a common thing in theory anyway not necessarily this kind of board texture but let's say the button raised you called the small blind and the big blind called and the board was queen seven five you would do potentially a lot of leading on a queen high board because you get to knock out this guy's range uh in the big blind you have a lot of you know off suit broadway high cards yourself and this guy here is basically sandwiched and whenever someone's kind of sandwiched here you can almost force equity out from him you know um yep. There's a there's a lot there's a line here which I actually follow and I think is quite good is that every single time you flatten the small blind and the big blind calls, you could lead one big blind on every single board and basically like soft collude against the button to just force the big blind out of loads of equity. So like let's say this was the flop and button raised, you called big blind called and you just lead yeah. led one point two big blinds. Let's say like a very small amount. He's gonna have to fold, you know. A decent amount of equity for that size and you know he's gonna have to fold his like king jack offs king queen offs he's gonna have to fold his random like 
uh, Jack Six suited with a backdoor flush draw, backdoor straight draw. You actually knock out quite a lot of hands there. And you don't risk that much that the, that the button can just like completely take advantage of you. And you kind of just, you're kind of punishing him for having another guy to act after uh, yeah. kind of thing. He's like, who's totally uncapped? A big button? Letting the other guys totally uncapped, like the button's uncapped, so he can't continue to wait, right? Exactly, yeah. So I actually like leading here in the small blind. Um, I actually like to lead here in the small blind. Um, okay. This is, yeah, I'm guessing you checked, but we're going to play it. Um, so check, check. This guy bets are really small now, very, very weird, very bizarre. This guy raises. So now this is a kind of weird spot. Um, yeah, it's, it's a very weird spot. And I actually decided to just overcall here, which is not, I mean, some, I, don't, I can't remember the last time I did that, but I, I, I thought if this guy's got something like 10-9, if I raise, is he going to call? No. So I don't, I don't really think we're getting value um, from, a whole, from a whole lot if we make this like 900. Yeah, it's, very, it's a very awkward spot. Uh, it's a very awkward spot. I think call is reasonable. I don't think that's bad. I think free bet's also reasonable. I think call-in's good because if you do free bet, this guy may get away from jacks or queens. Like, it looks very, yeah. very strong, you know? So, I mean, well, he's bet so small. I doubt this guy has jacks or queens, right? When he bets that small. I mean, I think that's very unlikely. I don't, but I don't you never, the I thing know. is with these guys, you never know. Like they're, I, mean, I, mean, I mean, I'm almost treating this as a check, to be honest. But maybe you disagree. Yeah. Okay. So we go and uh, call the big blind folds and this guy folds. So we go to the free of spades. I assume we're going to check. And for the big blind here, uh, for the button, sorry, he checks back. So yeah. at this point, I imagine he had a hand where he kind of raised for some thin value information. Like let's say a hand like seven, eight suited, pocket eights, pocket nines, yeah. Yeah. pocket sixes, maybe even like a 10 nine, which now checks back. Even a hand like ace 10 thinking, okay. Let's just be careful. Yep. Uh, yeah, uh, and I decided to block here. My reasoning was, if this guy just has like jack 10, 7, 8, we'll probably get a call if we bet very small, but we're not going to call if we bet big. If this guy's a hand like ace 10, he's going to raise the free bet if we block bet. That was my thinking. We yeah, usually, usually he'll he, usually he will raise his ten. Yeah. Also, you have to be somewhat careful about like check raising or anything or like getting all the money in because you know he's gonna have ten extra spades. He's gonna have seven extra spades. It's not that like the ten being a heart rather than a spade is definitely a lot worse for you than you know the ten being a spade and the five being a heart. He's gonna have some jack ten of spades, queen ten of spades, king ten of spades, ten nine of spades, ten eight of spades. Like he would probably play all of those hands exactly like this. So. It's definitely, it's not like a massive consideration, but it's definitely something to, it's not like it's the, the nut river or anything like this. I wouldn't yeah, con yeah, yeah. consider it a total blank. Um, so I think I did a bit very small. I guess you went for about this size and, uh, oh, you actually bet exactly that amount. Um, oh, you bet three, seven, six, seven, sure. This guy just called and a seven, yeah, that kind of sucks. The one thing i would say about potentially checking is that people randomly will be aggressive on an ace thinking that they can represent it or think that it's a danger or scare card for you or you don't have any ace x so if, if you we did this hand against the under the gun razor i would i would have checked but when we play it against the guy who's taken this line it's i mean that he might not recognize that at all so i know what you're saying but like it's, it's just he shouldn't have that many ace x here unless it's two pair right in which case, you know, that's, that's one of the reasons why I bought them. Yeah, I think people... But he's not, not going to have an ace jack of clubs here, right, ever. So it's, I mean, yeah, I think people will often panic into bluffing. So, like, let's say he has a hand like queen, jack of diamonds, which raise the flop. Bluffing, yeah. check back the turn because you called, you probably have a 10 or something. And then ace comes on the river, he's like, okay, well, you know, have to bluff kind of thing. Um, right, but yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, I think kind of unfortunate you didn't get a raise in from him, but I understand why he didn't raise as well. Um, but yeah. Uh, sorry, sorry, can I just step away for like literally thirty seconds? Sure. Go. Yep. All good. Okay, so let's just carry on. This is queen five off, same as before. This is exactly a min raise. So, um, 
yeah, slightly better odds than before. It was almost 2.5x before, I guess, 2.3x. Um, I typically would always call versus the min raise. Um, and yeah, I'd fall I think that's the min raise better, basically. I yeah. think I do call it. Yeah. Uh, flop check. You bet. I think we could continue. Could we continue here? Uh, I would if, if, if it was like the three of hearts instead of the two of hearts, I think it's an obvious continue. We hear it's with dodgy. Yeah, I would just I would just fold. Hands just okay. not strong enough here, I don't think. Um yeah, I'd fold. Nice. Okay, next hand, we're gonna fold. Yep. We move on to the next one. A6 of hearts, kind of a cuspy one, I guess. This is something you'd always fold in a cash game, but would consider opening in no, a time. No, 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 I would open this in a cash game every time. I would never fold this in a cash game. Oh, in, in eight-handed cash as well, like in a full ring cash game? Oh, right, handed I don't know. Um, E6 maybe a bit on the cusp. Um, yeah, and uh, I, I mean, the thing is, in cash, people don't call. Like, when you're playing 100 now, people are three big on fold. So you get to open a lot. Um, you know, you, you can open... For example, King 10 offsuit under the gun, and that's if everyone has a three bet rating of like 12. So you, you can open really, really wide in cash games. In tournaments, people cold call you a lot, so you have to be more selective about the hands. And I would still, open, look, I'm just going to open any suited ace here. Do you think that's. You, you ever heard of suited aces? Yeah, I, I would always, I would basically try to play suited aces from everywhere, especially, like I said, with very high SPRs, you will be able to yeah. put in. Um, very very large raises where people will have inelastic falling ranges where they'll have never fold a set never fold a worse flush you want to basically yeah the deeper you are and then you're going to be playing like 200 big blends deep in this tournament 150 big blends deep etc these pseudo aces will be you know part of the strongest hands you'll be playing so yeah folds from them then two unfolds two four we're going to fold so we're just going to race through a few more of these and then we're going to go to the final table um but pocket freeze here again Pocket pairs, typically, the deeper you are, they actually go down a lot. Like, when you get to, say, 20 yeah, big blinds... Like when you're above 100, right? They start these, like, small and stuff. But... Yeah, when you get to, like, 20 big blinds, pocket pairs do really poorly, like, as calls and raises, because yeah, yeah. the advantage of flopping the set's not great. When you get to, like, 50, 60, 70, they become the best times, because you get, like, no one can fill top pair versus, um, versus a set. You know, if they've got top pair for... 30 big blinds, they just go with it, they fast play, they go for protection, value, etc. But when you get to like 120 big blinds, if all the money goes in on 10, 7, 3, you're not going to be up against yeah. queens. They're going to be playing a lot more yeah. cautiously. So something to look out for in the tournament, you know, you want to be a little bit careful with these pocket pairs. However, you know, still going to be playing them, you're just going to be playing them somewhat cautiously. So I assume that you opened, you did, uh, call, raise, uh, and I guess you're not used too much to playing against like calls in this position in cash game and then face and squeezes. So what are your thoughts in this kind of situation? Uh, well, I just, I, I just literally folded because the, uh, the guy who raised, the guy who's three bet is not deep, is not that deep. So I just folded. But I thought this is not a good hand. If the other guy over calls, we could easily get set over said. Um, I just folded here. I don't think this is a great spot. I would say you're pretty deep. You're 80 big buns deep, right? Uh, I would consider that on the deep sides, deep stack side. I would fold here if you were somewhere around about 50 big blinds deep. Um, I think pocket pairs in general often play uh, as calls. I'm going to actually just open uh, a sim. This is a, this is a big raise, by the way. This is like, uh, I mean, compared to what I put in, I know there's another guy who's called. Yeah. Um, yeah, it's large. I wouldn't say it's like... Uh, super large though. Um, let's just have a look at Owen. Well, it's not large. What I meant was it's, it's not like he's raised some crazy amount. But what I mean is it's it's more yeah. for me to call. You know, he's factoring for the other guy in there. Let's just look as if we're looking looking at a hundred big blinds deep. So like even deeper, just to see from there, and then we can navigate around. So this is going to be pre flop. We're going to see here that we're going to open from this position two point five x. See all the pocket pairs are in the range. This guy is going to call 2.5x. You're going to see it's all of the uh, all the green hands. So it's going to be a bunch of pocket pairs, a bunch of suited hands, a bunch of suited aces, some ace queen offsuit, kind of a standardish range. He's probably even a little bit wider. A little bit. You'll probably you'll see a little bit more passiveness with some suited hands, and with the pocket pairs probably don't get free bet as aggressively as they should do. Um, he calls. 
and then the next guy squeezes. This is to a full 11 big blinds, which I believe is, uh, uh, this is even bigger than what this guy went to. So he's gonna go to 11 big blinds, uh, and then everyone else is gonna fold. This guy folds, this guy folds, and it's back to you. And you can see here that you wanna play no calls at all. We just play a four better fold range. And this is very kind of normal in tournaments that when we're the first guy to act here, we often play very tight because we're not incentivized to slow play at the top of our range. Like let's say queens, kings, aces, ace, king suited. So when we do put in 11... When you like, think we're not incentivized to play that, is it, is it just because we're like basically we've opened under the gun and someone has three better, so they just must have a strong range. So yeah, they're free bet in real. Yeah, they're free bet. Yeah, we want to get in, you know, and we have aces, kings, and queens. We really want to get the money in against, you know, their ace, king, their jacks. We want them to call their king, queen suited or whatever uh, and peel. And also, when we call here, we're giving this guy a good price to call behind Volvo's pocket pairs, which is, you know, not going to be yeah. great for us to call with whatever else. When we start having a very capped range here, there's actually a lot of dead money. So let's just say we called here. There would actually be like 30 big blinds dead almost. We start giving this guy a relatively attractive price to go all in. The reason why he doesn't go yeah. in so much is because we're not calling anything. But it typically in MTTs, when it does go uh, raise, call, squeeze, typically we want to play mostly four better fold. Um, the, one of the other reasons why we don't want to call too much is because there's not too many hands which are very attractive to flat. If we have a hand like Jack tends suited, you know, we're dominated against his bluffs, against his value, we're in very tough shape. If we have on like pocket threes, pocket fours, they're not making too much money calling. Um, I would have a calling range here against some people. I would call hands which would potentially set over set this guy's range. So if this guy has, let's say, deuces plus, which he's going to have preflop a lot, he's going to call every pair once you call. So yeah. if I had a hand like tens or nines or eights or sevens, I would likely would have a call in range here and maybe I would call a, ha a hand like ace queen suited and then I would encourage this guy to come behind with hands we do, you know, pretty well against kind of thing. Yeah, I, I would have probably called about, if I had sevens, eights, nines here, I'm, I'm going to call. And it's, although my, my perspective is different, my perspective is just, I don't want to get set up or set by the guy in front of me. I wasn't thinking about set or setting in myself. It's the same principle, I guess. Exactly, same concept. Queen jack, we're going to open. I guess you're going to get 2.5x. Um... They all fold, which is good news. We're going to fold for sure here. Uh, this is an interesting concept again, just quickly we'll we'll, we'll look into. Uh, call in the big blind as the third player. So uh, this is probably something a lot of people do incorrectly. Uh, what's your kind of approach here? So someone min raises, let's just say 2.5x, this guy called and you're in a big blind. What kind of hands do you think you should be calling, folding, free bet, and how would you, how would you play your range there? I would still call stuff like, four to suit, but I wouldn't call stuff like king eight off suit. It's actually quite funny. I, I had exactly king eight off suit in my mind when I was like thinking about this spot, which I was hoping you would say you would fold. So it's, that, that's actually, it just, it was weird. I was just about to speak about king eight as a, as a, as a principle. So let's just have a look again uh, here. So we're going to look here at this guy's going to open. This guy's going to flat. It's going to fold to your big blind. I think this one might be relatively surprising for a lot of people watching. How many strong hands were actually folding here in the big blind? Ace nine off. I think if you go to your local casino, if you go to yeah, I, even, would, I wouldn't have folded ace nine off. To be fair, I would have called ace nine off for sure. Ace nine off. I I mean, I would probably call some of the wheel aces way ahead of ace nine off. Like ace nine off just will never. Let's say the board comes nine high. You're against two ranges. It's very likely you have top pair by the river when the flop is nine high. If the board comes ace high and someone bets two streets, you basically always fold in. Like if the board is yeah. ace jack four six and you face two streets, you're going to be folding ace nine, you know, like especially versus three streets. So you're never really comfortable calling that kind of hand. Um, they just don't really play so well. Uh, the low the low ace x hands will will be a lot better than like ace six, ace seven, ace eight, ace nine. Again, the king eight kind of hand you said, but you see a relatively simple thing here is that basically if we have an offsuit hand, we fold. And if we have a suited hand, typically we're calling. Um, and we free bet relatively linear as well. But um, I think for some people watching this, this might be one of the biggest surprises, just how tight you call. I always know that 
when I go to like a live casino and it goes like raise call and I'm in the big blind and you fold, they're like, oh my God, you're so tight. What a nit. How can you fold? You're getting such a good price, blah, blah, blah. But really, I'm always just like, you know, like that's just not how it works. Um, so yeah. No, it's, I mean, it's worse that the guy calls, right, for 90% most of your hands. So you don't want to look at like three ways out of position. So we're going to play a couple more hands and we're going to go to the final table. We've done almost half an hour now. So this is an interesting one. We have ace king. Typically ace king is actually, I was going to say it's a hand which you always free bet, but it's actually a hand which we slow play quite a lot um, in the hijack in the cutoff versus opens. It's a hand which kind of, in, kind of likes to see a squeeze behind, maybe a full bet. We can five bet all in with a bunch of their money. Maybe it goes like, free bet then cold call and we can back raise shove all that kind of stuff um it's not ecstatic to get in 100 big blinds against an open all that kind of stuff so yeah. in late position we will typically free bet but you know flat call indefinitely helping protect you know by having a relatively wide call in range we definitely don't want to flat call aces kings queens we want to fast play them so it's nice to have some pretty strong hands in there um but ace king here i'm assuming you're gonna free bet yeah if the I... problem with one person left to add i don't think it's flat and has much merit at all you, yeah. uh, so sizing, I assume you're going to go around about 5x, I would assume, something like this. 5x is yeah. open, maybe even larger, potentially, we'll see. Um, 6x, okay, very nice. This is this is very good, something which, uh, again, probably most people, I think, won't be doing so correctly. They'll probably be going something like 350 or 400. The fact you go 600, I think, shows you have good positional awareness, you know you're out of position. You want to chop. He's basically, if he's in position, your range is very defined as, you know, very strong, big hands. He can basically come along at this stack depth. If you go, say, 350, he can basically call any two cards in an attempt to kind of try to hit two pair against you or yeah. make you fold your range on like a certain, on certain board textures like six, seven, eight or four, five, six or seven, eight, nine, wherever it may be. Obviously, you'll have some of those hands in your range, but he'll be able to put lots of pressure on you. So, to basically charge him for the pleasure of playing a position against you, you want to really charge him a premium. That's kind of how we look at it. Uh, is that how you thought when you went to 600? Yeah, well, I mean, basically it's just because, you know, in, in cash people are going to raise to 2.5, they're going to make it to 12.5. That's the strategy I use. And it's we're deep enough to just basically employ the same thing here. And it's just something I know, you know, I'm going to be comfortable with no more my ranges after. Um, but yeah, he's still going to call his queen right. He's still going to call his jack suit and his ten suit. We're still we're not really forcing out much stuff that we want to keep in. Yeah, exactly. So we've raced ahead now. I guess ten or so orbits. We've got pocket nines. You're gonna, I guess, raise. So you were raising previously to two point five x. Um, at this stack depth, I would probably lower that to around about two point two x. You're gonna have some hands which are going to potentially shove on you. When you get free bets, you know, it's going to be yeah. different prices. Uh, typically, just over 50 big blinds, 2.5x. Under 50 big blinds, starting to go to 2.2x. Once you get to, let's say, 20 big blinds effective, or there's some stacks under 20 big blinds, typically that's when we'd go into a min raise or a 2.1x. There's some very intricate stuff like raising to an even larger size if the big blind's very shallow to give him a worse price. But typically, that's kind of how we're going to... Do our bet size and yeah, I, I'd, I'd probably agree with that. Although I'm probably opening, I'm probably starting min raising below sort of 35 big points. Sure, sure. Um, so you're gonna raise, you went to to min raise. I would, I would still go slightly larger, but whatever. Uh, this guy shoves, and uh, what are your thoughts here? Slam on call. Sure, so I wouldn't, I, I typically wouldn't be like. Uh, I mean, I mean, I know maybe not slam dunk, but like if I have, I think, I think like it, this is like at the lower end of a hand I'm not considering for. Yeah. If I think it's eight and sevens, I'm like, yeah. Um, but I think, I think that's I'm just not really considering folding this. Yeah. So like, like I would for sure never fold tens or jacks. And eights is kind of questionable. Well, nines is kind of at the bottom end of a hand. I'm just not folding. Yeah. You know? Yeah. So basically, um. It's tough because uh, I also remember, like I can't remember specifically, but I remember I absolutely snap called this, and it was, I think maybe this guy had been shoving a lot, or was like just me pipping a lot, or I seen him do something stupid before. So I remember 
I would normally think like, oh, this sucks and take a wee, a wee while. But I remember just absolutely snap calling this as if I had like aces. So um, yeah, I, I, would, I, I, I think I, we might have something on with that guy. I can't remember. I would definitely, um, I would definitely call. I wouldn't consider folding either. I'm just saying it's not so thrilling potentially because um, at around about 30 big blinds, he probably shouldn't shove pocket pairs. He should probably call them. So you are going to just be flipping a bunch of the time, which, you know, against a guy who you may have a huge edge on, you don't want to flip against him so much. He's probably not shoving, let's say, a seven suited or king seven suited. It's more like king ten of diamonds, ace jack offsuit, ace king offsuit. So I'm not like thrilled but just because of the you know the odds we're getting and we may run into eights and sevens as well uh i will i will go with the hand obviously um but i wouldn't be like super thrilled you know like yeah, yeah. i wouldn't be super thrilled if this was let's say towards the bubble and we had the same stack size i'd probably think about folding because yeah, yeah, yeah. another consideration at 27 big blinds is that he may not free bet call the top of his range so hands like tens jacks queens he might just shove for 20. A lot of players you'll see just won't have like three bet call ranges off less than 30 big blinds. They'll just play shove or fold. They'll only three bet call, let's say, aces and kings. But, yep. you know, whatever. Um, so it, it's very likely he has a lot more over pairs than under pairs when he shoves. But some people will just have deuces anyway. So, yeah, um, sixes, yeah, yeah. sixes. Uh, and yeah, we win, which is good news. Let's go to the next massive hand, which takes us towards the final table. We're looking for some double greens. Seems like you're just chipping up nicely, which is good. Uh, uh, a big triple up with aces is just for this one is here. One? Might be not. No, it won't be this one. I think. Um, Let, just let's see this. Also. Let's see this one anyway. So uh, this guy raises kind of an interesting one. We have aces. And oh no, I remember this one. Yeah, I'd be uh, flat here if I remember correctly. Yeah, flat call will be the only option here. At 22 big blinds, typically we want to play shove fold. It's actually yeah. an interesting one just to look into. Um, sure, you're not, sure, you're not big blind. We're not playing trouble. Yeah, so 20 big blinds in the big blind here. Uh, we're going to fold around to the button. So typically, offsuit ASEX hands will be hands we shove here. We will also shove some hands. I'm just saying before it goes on it, so I'm not narrating through, but we will also end up shoving a lot of suited hands, like 10-8 suited, jack-8 suited, jack-9 suited potentially, because we can, whenever you're shoving, you always, the main thing you're always trying to think about is, um, can I get them to fold hands which dominate me? You know, it's like if you're shoving 10 8, you can make them fold jack 10, you can make them fold queen 10, king 10, which is really good for you. And then the second thing you're asking yourself is, do I have decent equity when called? And when you shove 10 8, you get called, you're typically going to have decent equity. I'm not saying we definitely will shove 10 8 here, but it's just something which, oh, sorry, this is, this is me being an idiot here. One second, I'm just going to fold the cutoff. Uh, so the button's going to raise here. And also something interesting is that he should be limping, starting to consider yep. limping. Probably you're not going to see anybody limping off 20 big blinds. So because they have hand, the limping range will typically be hands, which are mostly dense around hands, which will be raised folding. So typically in the big blind, you'll always have more fold equity than you would do, let's say in a sim. Also people will shove less than they probably should as well. You're not going to see people shoving jack 10, queen 10, uh, a7 off, a8 off as much as you would do in a sim, especially because what's working in your favor here is that they have this guy's stack doesn't doesn't allow him to just open shove hands onto yep. you like jack 10, queen 10, deuces, threes, fours, ace, deuce, ace, three, all that kind of stuff, a7. So whenever you have like a, a small stack and you play against a big stack who opens into a big stack and a small stack, you should also you should always shove on them really aggressively because they they won't play a limp here and they won't play shoves here and they'll probably call you too tight and they'll probably raise too wide as well. Um, so for that reason, I think like you, you'll probably see that they'll because at forty or fifty big blinds deep, right? They will always raise six five suited, four five suited, seven five suited, etc. But because you're in the equation at twenty big blinds, these six five suited, seven five suited, eight five suited, nine five suited, king two suited. Four free suited, you know, these kind of like nine eight offsuit, which will be hands which you may want to V pip at four and your fifty big blinds deep, they now go down a lot in EV because you're 20 big blinds effective in the big blind. But when he sees his stack, he's like, Oh, I've got 50 big blinds, this guy's got 50 big blinds. So they're often going to be raising too much, and you can really punish that. Um yeah. with aces, let's just have a look again of how it would look like if you all had this stack size. Um, you can see here that 
Ace is, Ace is actually going all in, 100% time, really? which I would, which I would never yeah, I would do. Thought, I thought it was a pure call. Okay. Yeah, I would also. I would also uh, pure call as well. And it, I'm pretty sure it will, or very likely will be, a higher EV as a call. Um, these, very interesting you see here, this king-queen suited, king-jack suited, queen-jack suited, they don't shove because they don't have the principles which I was talking before about folding up better hands. So with king queen suited, yeah. if you shove, they're not folding ace king, they're not folding ace queen, they're not folding any pocket pairs. So yeah. these kind of they, suited... they, they keep more ten as well, right? Like if we shove, he's going to fold king ten, and we can keep king ten in as well, right? Exactly, and you can basically there'll basically be no board where you'll fold king queen suited, like maybe like a specific four five six kind of board, but. You'll basically get to call every board. You'll be able to check raise for value. You'll be able to check raise bluffs and stuff. You'll be able to, you know, get loads. Of, whenever you flop a pair and he flops a pair, you're always going to get all the money and all that kind of stuff. But you can see here, a lot of our shoves come from these hands I was talking about, like 10-8 suited, jack eight suited, queen eight suited, 10-9 suited, 7-8 suited. I think most people, not most people, but a lot of like non-experienced players, they would always shove king-queen before a hand like king-5, king-6. But king is great, like... You fold out so much better hands from your opponent. We're just going to see what happens when we shove here. Um, so you can see here, when we shove, say, king five, we're making them fold king nine, king eight. We're making them fold king jack off, queen jack off. We're making them fold loads of ace x. We're making them fold seven, eight suited. We're making them fold the low pocket pairs when he raises. And a lot of players will fold, like, king jack suited, king ten suited as well. Um, yeah, king ten suited, potentially. King jack suited is going to feel like a strong hand. But, like, jack ten suited, for sure. So you are get just these hands, like the suited king X, people are very, very used to shoving like suited ace X. Like if they get dealt ace five suited, they'll be like, oh yeah, I'm all in here. But really there's not too much difference between ace five suited and king five suited. And if anything, king five might even be better because the big, the button is not raised folding like king two to king six, but he's raised folding ace two to ace six at like full frequency. So you even yeah. unblock even more of the raised fold range. Uh, potentially, d depending on how his range is constructed, but uh, yeah, with aces, I would slow play, and I think it's good that you did slow play. Um, so yeah, you went for a call. He going to go post flop, flop top set. Um, so I guess you're going to check. He kind of an interesting board for him, a board where he could start having some slightly bigger bets on ace queen yeah. free he may not want to see better well, hand like i mean i mean at, um when we start getting to the sort of 20 big blind below are we not supposed to actually start using some bigger bet sizes on the a side boards that's something i've seen in a few sims quite a lot yeah so well, not big, big, guys, i think it's just because the other the big one's going to have tons of a6 and we're going to dominate the vast majority of them i don't know if that's why the reason is but i, I, I occasionally like when you're sort of 20 big mistake you have this like sort of very very small size and then the big size is like kind of half pop Often see the half pot size getting used on ace side boards. Yeah, so the ace, like let's say the board is uh, queen jack deuce. Often you can yeah. count the deuce a little bit like a PLO concept that the deuce is almost like a dangler uh, because people don't defend like offsuit deuce x. Even a lot of suited deuce x people may fold some of it. So the deuce x really like doesn't interact with the board at all. So whenever the board has a deuce on it, usually you're going to see small sizes because you get to fold out. A lot of the range for a very efficient price and yep. asex is also quite similar to that of shallow stack sizes because with asex a lot of people will have no asex in their range here in the big blind they'll shove every single asex like they'll shove ace deuce to ace king suited and they'll shove ace deuce to ace king off which is fine all of those hands will be profitable reshove so it's 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 like a fine strategy so on these board textures a lot of your hands actually will just be fine but in small as well like let's say you have a hand like seven eight of hearts like yep. that just folds out lots of stuff for a cheap price let's say you have a queen you get value for the cheap price it's like you don't necessarily need to go so big on this exact board because you just everything you want to achieve with every part of your range you will achieve it for a small size in. and you're also shallow enough that you can get multiple streets with queen x anyway if that makes sense but i mean um, even in, even in cash games like this isn't like, like some people bet big on these boards some people bet small i i, I would always bet big or check on this board but some people so the deeper you are, the deeper you are, like let's say you're 100 big blinds deep, mm -hmm. I would definitely start having some big bets then from uh, the button because I w let's say you're at 40 big blinds deep. I want to try to 
force all the money and somehow if I can, you know, you could even start over betting the flop. Over betting the flop here would be reasonable too. Um, yeah, yeah. Because your queen I mean, jack if, is... If I'm playing 100 zoom here, I, I'm betting 80% or I'm checking, basically. Yeah, I agree. So the deeper you are, I would do that for sure. And the shallower you are, the smaller sizes I would use here typically. Um, you go for this small size. Uh, he goes for that small size. I guess we're going to go for a call. Um, turn is going to be an eight. Potentially could consider leading, but probably we're not going to do it. I guess you can check. Uh, he I mean, goes, it's it's to get called. Really. goes for check back. River seven. I would definitely go for a block bet here. I don't expect him to go bet check bet as a bluff here very often. I think he's going to just check a bunch. Yeah, I, I did. I, sorry, okay. I, I was I was thinking that, but I thought like. I mean, we just so heavily block a6 that we're only really looking at a queen, which he may have checked, behind, which he might just check behind a lot. Well, you can um, also have an, you can have an eight, you can have seven, you can have three. You you have you have actually a decent amount of bluffs here. You have jack ten off, you have king jack yeah, yeah. off, you have um, king ten off, you have four five offsuit, you have four two suited, you have five two suited, um, you have king of clubs nine, king of clubs uh five king of clubs four king of clubs two you probably are continuing on the flop I you mean, have maybe like sizes as well like if we have like king ten like with no clubs and we have king ten with a club we're probably gonna use a different sizing for bluffs if we have a, like the flush and we have like a, you know ace five offsuit we're gonna use different sizes yeah um... potentially yeah so anyway with aces i think you're not gonna get much ev from him bluffing against you you're not going to get much ev from him value betting against you but i think there's decent amounts of ev for him bluff catching against you also when you do bet small who knows maybe he decides to bluff a hand like king of, king of clubs x or jack of clubs x even though it doesn't make too much sense maybe he decides to bluff a seven blocking some river two pairs whatever it may be um i'm not saying he will but you know maybe he does sometimes and i think let's say he has a hand like king seven he'll definitely put more money into the pot uh, versus a block than he will versus a check because he's never going to yeah. bluff a seven because he just beats three X. Um, so I, 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 I a check in the spot. Yeah, I would have bet. Uh, and he and checks. He oh, had queen. he had queen jack. Yeah, like people. That's something you'll learn in tournaments is that people typically will not look for thin value a lot of the time. They will just be scared to get check raised. They will just be happy to take the pot down, especially in a tournament the size of the tournament which you're in a plane. You'll have a lot of scared money. Yep. So it's important to go for block bets in big well, pots. I'm um, not really yelling at the guy for not, but, you know, going, well, how could you not bet Queen Jack for value? It's just that, you know, you, you exp my thinking was that you, a lot of people don't recognize that they should just be betting that board every time we'll just check back with a hand like Queen Jack with a Queen on the flop. So I, I thought like he probably doesn't have actually that many queens, and therefore if he has an ace that he's checked behind because the flush came in, he's probably going to bet it on the river. And if he has some like random hand, he might go, "Oh, this guy's checked twice. He probably has like a what was the other card, a deuce or whatever." And bet it. That that was my thinking there. Yeah, cool. So now we're on the final table. Um, obviously. Very different to playing early stages. We have ICM to consider. Every page jump is good for us. Um, just looking at the stack sizes now, we have one guy with less chips than us, another guy with less chips than us, another guy with less chips than us. We are on the short side. So we are like, let's say six out of nine or five out of nine. We have this guy here with a huge stack, which is very good for us because we have position on him. Um, we, are we have pretty nice stacks on our left. Sometimes on your left, if let's say we were in this seat here, we would have a very bad seat because yeah, yeah. we'd be raised into guys who can shove on us, but these guys won't be able to shove on us because they are so deep behind. So um, going into final table, do you have any reads, dynamics, uh, anything? Uh, I, I think like absolutely nothing at this point. I, I, I don't remember having any notes on any player. Um, I was moving tables quite a lot before it. Um, so we've got almost nothing on anybody beyond like sort of what the HUD says for about sort of 60 or 70 or 80 hands for people. So that's definitely something which I would consider if you go deep in this tournament that when there's four tables left, you may as well get all the, all the tables up, see who's fast playing, see who's slow playing, see yeah, who's scared money, etc. I, 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 I typically, um, I think at this point I was two tabling. So I'm, I'm not, I have this weird thing, I, I find two tables much rather than multi-table than cash games because you're just different stack depths and everything, and especially if you're adding in bounties and satellites and other stuff like that. But um, 
I I brought the other table up when there was two tables left. Cool, cool. Let's have a look what happens then. So Deuce's first hand, this guy raises, I assume we're gonna fold. Oh, this guy free bets. I assume we're folding, nice. Let's go to the next hand. Ace nine, I assume we're gonna fold. Yeah. Let's go to the next hand. I think very well, this will be the first interesting one. So guy raises, this guy calls. Oh. This guy Jacko seems to be on the loose side. He's free bet two out of three hands so far. So something. Yeah, I, actually, as things go on, didn't did not get that vibe. I actually thought he was pretty cautious, but um, we'll see that later because he's we play a lot of hands against him later. Um, uh, this is a good start. Uh, this guy this, all in. We have to get even better. So um... we are obviously going to re go in. There's no reason yeah. to call here. And then we get over. oh wow. Okay. And it's also, it gets even better as jacks versus ace check. They have to give us a swap though, right? They have to give us a sweat, right? But no king comes, so we're good. So, things have changed now. We are now second in chips. We can we have a different strategy to what we had two hands ago. We were kind of trying to outlast some people, but now we kind of potentially can win the tournament. So, there's a lot. There's often a lot of uh, inaccurate thoughts about ICM. It's like uh, now we have sixty three big blinds. We want to play really cautiously against the big stack. Actually, now we want to play a lot looser against the big stack than we did in the previous orbit. Because yeah. if we doubled up from twenty big blinds to forty big blinds, we would just be middle of the pack. But now, because we have sixty big blinds, if we double up, we'll be chip leader, and now we can start bullying everyone, free bet and raise and more, etc. So the, you actually gamble more the deeper you are a lot of the time. So you will gamble more, let's say, second in chips against first in chips than you would, let's say, six in chips against first in chips of this distribution. So it's actually yep. kind of an interesting one. Um, and something people will often uh, get wrong. 10-8 suited here. I would actually raise. Um, I think you have got a good hand. I think uh, we have good stack. If we get three bets, completely fine to fold. I think everyone will be playing quite passive. There's no stacks which can shiv on you. Um, did yeah, you raise? I, I, this would be, I can't remember the raise before, this would be borderline to me. I did raise, yeah. Oh, this is an annoying hand. Yeah. This guy leads, uh, so maybe not necessarily too bad of a lead, you know, very pocket pair heavy. You have a lot of king jack offsuit and queen jack offsuit and ace jack offsuit and, you know, a lot of suited aces which have just missed like ace deuce to ace five. He's typically going to be very, very pocket pair and suited broadway heavy, so... You often do actually miss here quite a lot. Um, if the stacks were reversed, as if like he had 63, you had 40, leading here actually would be not too bad. It would be putting pressure on a guy who gets covered. But as you cover him, you uh, he needs to be more careful than you do in this kind of situation. So uh, I don't think you should be leading, I but go on. Decided to click this back. I think we still got value from sevens, eights, nines, if he has the... The problem is we don't have it, like, if, this is much better if we have, like, 10 or something. Because um, we're not really getting value out of worst 10s, which is a bit of a problem. But I, I think, like, another thing I've noticed, like, people don't lead a 6 here. Like, ever. Um, well, he also, does, he also doesn't have a 6 in his range, right? Flat in the small blind. He probably doesn't... In well, you don't, know, you, don't, you don't know, like, you could just flat 6, 5, suited or whatever. 6, 4, suited, you know, you, you don't know. I don't, I don't know anything about this guy. Um, but the... I just think, like, the hand needs protection. We can get value from some stuff. We're in position. We can, like, check pipes and turns and play some rivers if we feel so inclined. I don't know what you think about that. Yeah, I can I can see I can see merits for it. I think it's fine. Um, folding out, like, King Jack off, honestly, is fine as well. Like, it's yeah, like, yeah, 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 as well. Such a cheap price. Um, so, turn here. I guess now we're going to check, and then Bluff Catch River probably... Hoping that he did some optimistic float with like Queen Jack of Diamonds or yeah, whatever. Like the to clubs, he could just block bet. Like he could bet like eights, thinking it's so it must be good, right? Yeah. So we're obviously gonna call. Um, he has a surprising hand. He has uh, jacks. Jacks. Yeah. I would say it's that surprising. Um, flat free seems fine. Uh, lead flop seems fine. This is like the thing I'm sure. Like flat free, just like. Covers my caffeine background just seems insane to me. But um, what do you think to his flat free? Can you talk more about that? I would always flat call pre-flop here. You yeah, always flat call pre. 
Yeah, it's kind of spot where you're not going to get in, say, 10s versus a free bet. So getting in 40 big blinds here, he's going to get it in in very bad shape. Uh, it's actually a decent spot with the big blind being in the big blind. He can squeeze and then you can get a back shove in potentially. Uh, it's a kind of spot where we want to be playing very careful. We don't want to free bet and then you four bet shove ace queen and ace king. We can't call off. We definitely don't want to free bet fold. We don't, don't want to free bet call, I don't think. Shoving's a bit too much. Uh, so to me, logically, the only the only option we have is to to flat call. Really, um, on the flop, I actually think it's kind of clever lead. You're, he doesn't really, he's not super thrilled about like check raise getting it in. Um, yeah. So leading kind of makes some good sense. Like I don't mind it. He also doesn't really right. want to check call because like you're going to check back king queen and realize equity whatever. Like he can bet multiple. If you just call the flop, he can bet multiple streets. I actually think surprisingly like good play i think uh i didn't expect to see pocket jacks here like with the line but surprisingly decent play i think um like what i what would you have done pre-flop uh yourself i, I would have like raised normal one and cycled off <laughs> yeah it would be a major sigh because I don't think you would have been able to get in like nines or eights or anything so you've now gone down a lot in chips you've gone from 60 to like 38 in big blinds but i think it's just the big blind going up a lot um it seems like everyone else is kind of actually no you you've gone to second last in chips now so it's definitely you oh, probably just I, lost I, a few points I, I had um some missing hands because my internet account had flipped my phone but it wasn't here that was early on so i don't know what happened there i can't remember i, I remember but i mean i can't remember what happened but obviously we lost a sizable pot was it just that was it just that, was it just that hand yeah, we did. We did lose a fair bit there. It wasn't a small pot. All right. Okay. Yeah. So I guess like the advantage of like min raising is more like when we've got like some blocker hand like king ten off or like ace eight off and there's like people ahead of us who can like jam we just lose less than that. Yeah, I think actually my order didn't work there. So yeah, basically why I would go for a larger raise size here is because with king queen off, ace nine off, ace ten off, pocket sixes, pocket fives, ace five suited, most of your range wants to take it down pre flop. You don't want to go against this guy. You don't want to go against this guy. You don't want this guy to call. You don't want this guy to call his 7 8 offsuit, etc. You're very, very incentivized to take down the pot pre flop. If you go for a min raise, this guy get, gets a better price to free bet against you. If you go for a min raise, this guy gets a better price to flat call against you. If you go for a min raise, this guy gets a better price to flat call a suit down or a pocket pair or a suit ace. If you go for a min raise, this guy gets a better. Uh, uh, price to flat call the big blind. So if most of your range wants these guys to fold, then typically you want to go for a larger size and with your whole range. Obviously, you don't want to just size aces for a min raise, uh, aces for a min raise and everything else for bigger size. So typically 2.5x in I ICM is, or you know, 2.25x, 2.3x, typically will work well. If, however, this button had, say, 12 big blinds, uh, then that would be a spot where I would play just the min raise because he's never going to cold call anyway. And if anything, go in a larger size and actually gives him a better price to shove on you rather than a worse price. So 
yeah, yeah. I'd go for like he free bets you. We're obviously going to fold. I, I hope so. Um, uh, yeah, yeah. Uh, typically, in this spot, we would play basically not no calls or very few calls. We don't really have. We don't really want to go to a flop. Like we don't. If we have queen jack suited, we we just want to fold. If we have jacked and suited, we just want to fold. If we have sevens, we don't really want to call. If we have ace jack off, we want to fold. If we have ace king, we want to just get it in. If we have tens jacks queens whatever, we want to go with it. So. If we had aces, you know, maybe you want to call, but um, typically this is a spot where we just want to play very, very, very passively. And even a hand like king queen suited, we may want to four bet shove rather than rather than call because we can knock out some ace queen offsuit free bet folds or some ace jack offsuit free bet folds, etc. Um, and we just take our equity kind of thing. Oh, you actually called. You actually called. Yeah, I, I, because I believe this was. Um, I did look up this in the charts now after I think this. Like what I was looking at a lot of like the charts for this, and a lot of the charts were just calling like a lot wider. I think I looked this up, and it was according to the chart call. Uh, so that would assume be like uh, at start of the tournament, you would definitely call. Being on a final table, things will just change at all. Like uh, right. there's no basically, well, there'll be they'll, It's very tough to have a chart which will have like. Stack size is all done for final tables. You can obviously yeah, yeah. run things afterwards and then find out exactly what you should do. But typically, um, typically we want to be playing uh, very few calls pre-flop versus free bets on final tables. And you'll almost never ever call an offsuit hand versus a free bet. Um, ace king offsuit would shove. Ace queen offsuit usually four bet folds or shoves or folds itself. Uh, suited hands sometimes you may call. I, I just mean in general. Uh, yep. Pocket pairs, you would often pocket pairs actually are the ones which are quite good hands to call with because either you let's say let's say you had let's say this board was queen eight six having king queen on that board is actually quite dangerous. There, you're going to run into ace queen kings aces etc. When all the money goes in, so it's not it, it starts becoming an even dicey when you flop well. Uh, however, with sixes and eights and sevens and nines. You flop either really well or really bad. You kind of get in or get out kind of thing. Uh, or maybe yep. you call like a 20% bet and then it's very easy to fold the turn. So pocket pairs are the kind of hands you might want to call, but uh, off suit hands definitely, definitely, definitely want to fold. Um, he bets and you just he fold. Just yeah. Uh, 3x, I kind of interesting. What, what, what are you thinking here? Um, I, I'm very sketchy on ranges here. Um, this hand seems like probably one we just have to call every single time. I don't think this. I don't think this one's getting three bit range. I think we're probably three bit more junky stuff and stuff with better blockers. I would imagine this will most likely be a fold in ICM. Um, right. Most likely. Uh, it's quite cuspy. Like queen six, queen seven. I think we definitely fold. Queen ten. I think we definitely call. I think these queen eights, queen nines, typically we will probably fold. Um, we're against an opponent with a big stack. He has no ICM on him at all. So he can, typically in ICM, you want to use really small sizes, right? So if everyone has 35 big blinds, when you go post flop, you do lots of 20% bet and 30% bet and 25% bet and 10% bet and lots of check in, very passive. Basically, there's like a concept where if you bet the flop, you're essentially like betting your stack almost, like you're putting it at risk to some degree. Whereas when you have this 111 big blinds, you're kind of carefree. You can blast it off, you can pot the flop, over bets, over bet turn, pot the turn, all that kind of stuff. So when you're against someone like this, where he has no ICM on him and you have lots of ICM on you. Um, re relevant actually here, just need to mention this guy had a pull car uh, avatar. Sure, yeah. So, uh, so yeah, I I, I assume this will is not a clown. I assume this will most likely be a fold. Um, yeah, I assume this will most likely be a fold. Uh, but yeah, um, I guess you called. Uh, yeah. Queen nine deuce. He bets small. We're gonna call. I guess no reason to raise. Uh, you call. Oh shit. Um, call. He bets small, you call. Now he blasts, and now we have a spot where we basically we have very strong hand for where, what we have. He has so many bluffs. Like he, has, you have to remember, pre flop in his range, he has like seven of diamonds, three, jack yeah. of diamonds, five, ten of diamonds, four. Like you're, uh, you're, ten you're, diamonds. You're big, you're big, so. <laughs> big pardon? 
So you're about to see that. So uh... <laughs> Yeah, so basically we get into a situation and we want to fold, but he's bluffing so much. This is kind of like a, a reason why we want to fold pre-flop, right? Because we're getting into such a dicey situation here and we basically have a spot where he has so many bluffs. We love and we do really well against so many bluffs, but we're in a situation where our stack's at risk. We're basically getting put to our torment life here with top pair and we're not thrilled about it, right? Like if this yeah. was Chippy V, you're absolutely... Like if you just give his range what he's raising pre-flop here, it's going to be different to a chippy V. But let's just say he's raising his range, which we can imagine now, and we get to this uh, pot on the first hand of a table. So let's say you go play a, a party poker live tournament. It's a guy you know is raising 100% of hands, and you get to this stage of the turn. You're like loving life. You're like, yeah, he's got this bluff, that bluff. Like, I'm just going to close my eyes, call down, call down, call down. But we're in this situation here on this fan table, like, fuck, he's going to put us to the test, and we're going to hate our life. You know what I mean? So it's like you've gone from yeah, like, absolutely just, loving it to hating it kind of thing. Yeah, like I was just really not thinking about ACM at all here. I was just thinking, well, this hand is kind of a monster range versus range. Yeah, exactly. And but that, imagine that's like kind of thing. I bet you like yeah, I was like really not thinking about ACM at all on this whole final table test. Like it's just just imagine you're on a imagine you're on the millions final table and the next page in between this and this might be uh like 300k and 495k or like 600k yeah, yeah. or 525k whatever it be it'll be like you know one house or, uh, or four 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 portions for the next page jump or whatever you know so um yeah. it's good to be prepared for it you know um but yeah you're gonna call and jack of diamonds very 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 bad river card obviously a lot of his turn barrels will have one diamond in them um i actually think on the river he should probably use a small size in and just block everything with those diamonds like if i had like eight of diamonds i'd still volley bet the river here just mm -hmm. against your queen x because you have so much queen x right so much yeah, nine yeah. x to get here with you don't really have many one I card big diamonds. i don't have any big diamonds ever like, no king queen, king queen or like diamonds I, or, like no king, like, king ten is a straight yeah like king ten maybe you have like but you probably don't have like king eight and call a flop bet you'll probably just fold maybe bluff yeah, sometimes yeah, yeah. Um, so I think you should bet a lot. Obviously, we're going to check. Yep. And ten three exactly. Yeah, uh, that's that's dicey. I would even block this hand for him. Like I would bet like yeah, yeah, 10, no, 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 ten percent bet. Uh, and if he is bluffing with something like five three or five six, no diamond, which he can have, he can just go after your one pair of hands for a small, a small, a small size and two. But yeah, that's obviously a frustrating one to lose. Uh, we're going to pull this, obviously. It's Jack, we're probably not full in. So 17 big blinds seems like a very easy all in to me. Any other consideration for you? No, very much. Very straightforward, especially given that we're last in chips. Right? So typical ICM uh, MTT theory is in these spots you would not go all in, you would put you would go to something like 20k. If this guy goes all in and he goes all in, then your ace jack's essentially dead. Then you would fold because you're gonna get the pay jump because this guy's range will be so strong to call two effective yeah, wins. Yeah, I'm aware of this concept, but I like, completely forgot about that. So I think I know, just shot in the chat. So it's a concept which actually doesn't make you much money. It's a very small concept. But for me, the reason why I always like to do it is because it, it shows me when I'm reviewing tournaments that I was playing my A game, that I was very dialed in, I was thinking very precisely about ranges, about what I was doing. I was like playing very well do you know what i mean it's a good way to gauge your game afterwards when you're doing reviews because you know that you're taking all of these small things into consideration uh so yeah i would i i it's not you know if you go all in this jack or don't go in this jack here it's not gonna you know change your career or anything but um it's just something to be very precise about and poker and mtts is all about being as precise as possible really queen 10 offset here i would go for a race um let's see what you do you do raise. So why would you maybe not raise here? Or what kind of situations would you maybe not raise Queen 10 here? Um, if there were, if like everybody ahead of me had like 10 big, if there were two players ahead of me were like 12 big blinds or less. And why would you not raise? Because they could, they could just go with like any ace x on the fold. Exactly. Um, so, so, I think with these guys, they can't go wide enough. And I think Queen 10 is a fine block hand to raise. So... There's the concept you said of they, they can go after you, and if you raise here, they can shove a lot wider on you. That's one thing. But another thing, if this guy has 10 big blinds, you have a theory called collision effect. So if you fold, he folds, he 
he's going to go all in around about 40% of the time. And between these two guys, they're going to call roughly, let's say, 50% between the two of them. So 20% of the time when you fold, you're going to get a pay jump, or you, oh, this guy's going to be all in and get called, you know? So the money you make from Queen-10 here is never going to be more than EV you get of this guy busting, let's say, 15% of the time in the tournament. Yeah. Because let's say the next pay jump in the millions is 165000 if this guy busts 10% of the time, then you're basically getting 10% of 160,000. So you're getting basically $16,000 for folding. But the EV of raising queen 10 or a marginal hand here will be very low. So that's kind of what collision effect is. It's not that they're going to shove wider on you. It's that they can shove wider against each other. Because let's say this guy has ace nine off in the big blind and this guy has king jack offsuit with 10 big blinds. If you raise queen 10 and this guy shoves, this guy will fold his, fold his ace nine. But if you fold, he will shove and he will call and then this guy will bust, you know, like 60% of the time or whatever. So it's just an important concept to understand on final tables. Um, but you get shoved and reshoved on, we fold, see what they have. Tens and jacks. Another good reason for 30 big blinds for this guy not to go all in for 75 big blinds. Your all in range here would be something like kings, queens, aces probably. Like even ace, kings in terrible shape here for... 40 big blinds and 30 big blinds. So I, you're... I, thought, I thought you meant just versus the initial one. Yeah, when they both call. Yeah, ace king is just. So I you would mean, go. With, with, yes, yes, just like this, this handballs guy probably has this guy beat. Right. So ace king, you're just like, just let him take it. Play another hand. Right. Yeah. So if you had queen, you'd go queens plus. So this guy has tens. Yeah. Uh, so if this guy has tens, if he just went to 25,000 instead of 75, when he goes all in, all in, he could easily fold his tens because you have queens plus and he's dead against you. And then he's going to get the pay jump, you know? Um, but yeah, let's just move on until we see some double green. So we still have 20 big blinds. Folds to the button who raises. Uh, this is a very important player to play against because we are competing for the last place right now. So winning chips against him is very important. Uh, and being aggressive against him is very important. I would definitely shove here. Um, I 20, shove. 20 big blinds. Uh, unfortunately, as he's 10. It's an absolute snap call, what we've been through ever. Oh, wow, well, nice. Nice. Yeah, I mean, I would definitely call Ace 10 too. Not much he can do there. Um, again, he wants to gamble against you a lot wider than he wants to gamble against Jacko. Because if he gambles yeah. against you, he gets a pay jump as well. If he gambles yep. against Jacko, he goes to third in chips. It doesn't really change much. You're still in the tournament. Um, okay, so that's a really good one. Let's keep going. Let's keep going put some double green, or we'll do the last 10 hunts. Okay, let's do from here. So you're now free-handed. The business yeah, end. Free, if you free skip the last two hands, they're, uh, you're, you're going to yell at me. So. No, no, we have to go through them. So I guess we're going to raise. Fold, and this guy calls. So by the way, I just did to clarify, handballs is like not good. But there was a weird dynamic going because this is what made this three-handed thing really frustrating is handballs were constantly raising to like three and four big planes from the button. Which made it really difficult because I couldn't defend a lot, and a lot of the time I was at a stack where I couldn't three bet fold versus three or four big blind open. Um, so that that made it really difficult. But other than that, he didn't seem like a he seemed like a bit fashion Was it Jacko was the guy who had the poker avatar? He seemed perfectly solid, although quite passive, considering he had a big stack. I thought he was very he was passive generally, but considering his position, I thought he was very very passive. Interesting. So. Jack seven, um, 10 high boards typically in MTTs are boards where you're going to have some big sizings. It's a board texture where King 10, Ace 10, even Queen 10, Jack 10 really want to get as much money in ASAP. Um, it's a board texture where your bluffs benefit. Let's say you have a hand like Queen seven of hearts here. You really benefit from him folding King Queen and King Jack and King seven of spades, whatever else it may be. Um, so it's typically 10 high, nine high, eight high boards. Your bet size is going to be a lot bigger. Queen high, king high, a side boards where it's more lockdown equity, it's going to be a lot smaller. Um, just typically as a general rule. In ICM, you'll still have big bets rather than, sm rather than small bets, but your big bets will become a lot smaller. So let's say the board was 10 yeah, 7. Think... Go on. I was going to say, I think my big bet here would just be like half pot. Exactly. So if you were in chip EV, you may go for 75%, but in ICM, just a natural adjustment is to make your big bets smaller, your small bets smaller, etc. So I'd go around about half pots here. Uh, there's my size in. Uh, you go small. Um, 
I typically would go for that bigger bet. I think you fold out King yeah. Jack, which is nice. Ace, even Ace Jack, like you know, for thirty five big blinds, you definitely have Ace Jack free still. I think you'll definitely fold Ace Jack versus a big bet versus this. You'll probably call, um, but you fold it's all good. Ten nine. I'm definitely gonna fold against this. It's fine. We're just gonna shove a lot. If he keeps doing this, our adjustment is just to shove a lot because there's so much dead money. Um, Jack 10, we're definitely going to limp here. We don't want to raise and get shoved on. Uh, so it's going to be a limp. You limp, he checks. I guess we're just going to stab around about third pot. We check, he bets. We're obviously going to call. Turn 10, he bets again for 2x pot. We're going to have to fold. So, so if you, um, I was big blind there, right? Was I big blind there? So yeah, I probably should have shoved, but I don't think I saw one out of no doubt. I, I, I can't ever see myself. No, um, all right. I don't know. I don't know why I didn't. I didn't bet that flop. To be honest, uh, um, I, I think I, I'm surprised. I would just bet that flop 100 percent of the time, pretty much. Yeah. Okay. Interesting. Yeah. Yeah. Flop seems stand. Turn seems a little bit more standard than I was thinking. It's a very weird line from him. Uh, I mean, this is still very weird, obviously. But yeah, obviously folding. Well, he long. was going for like enormous bets all the time. Like he was. There was multiple times where he shot like well over pot as a see bet. The George, the George Holmes of the big thirty three. Uh, George Holmes would have flatted the queens in the big blind with heads up. But when he's <laughs> betting, he's betting big. Yeah, he was playing, he was playing a small ball. Uh, King then off. We're gonna raise. He calls check check. I guess the board texture we're gonna bet. We can fold out King Jack, King Queen. We block both clubs and pots. Relevant uh, suits. So I guess we're gonna go around about third pots. You go. All apart, uh, face a raise, very suspicious raise, don't really believe it. Uh, yeah. It's hard to have a freeze, he really raised in 10 8, 10 7, but uh, you block a lot of bluffs like Queen 9 of Clubs, King of yeah. Hearts 8, so I would just fold. Or you call, which is definitely on the on the sticky side. What, what are your thoughts there? I guess I just didn't believe it and I didn't want to get it in. I mean, it's, it seems kind of silly to call now. I probably want something that actually has a bit more. Likely, like, I don't know what we should have like Queen Jack of Clubs here. Or, um, yeah, clubs. I mean, you could be getting bluffs here, but part of poker or part of ICM, especially, is that the big Zach gets to bully you and you just simp around, you know, like that's kind of, yeah, kind, yeah, of yeah. kind of how it is. A, a massive, massive factor is we've got Harry Balls who's 2x potting and blasting and 4x and pre. There's a lot of EB, EV to be made here. The EV of calling King Nine on 10 free free is going to be so small, like, even if it is a profitable call. Like you're making so, so like, let's go back to how many chips it was. Like when you call the 16, 10,000 more, you're probably making, let's say you're making profitable chips here. You're probably making like 400 chips. Whereas we have a guy who's like 4X into 15K where we can make, you know, like 10,000 chips. So even yeah. if this is plus EV marginally, this is a spot where we'd fold all of our marginal stuff because we have uh, a decent setup here. Um, yeah, definitely fold in. It's good. Ace four, I guess we're gonna be all in. Yep, looks good. King five, we're gonna just fold versus this. Oh, I, you threw a bit. Interesting. Yeah. Actually, it's good to, this was a bit dicey because it was like, as I was saying, this guy, like we have to three bet in the shop against this guy if he's only three and four X every time. And I thought like, I, I think this is a bit of mistakes. I just don't think I had the stack to, I think if I, this is actually not that bad if I have the stack to three bit fold, I don't think I really have the stack to three bit fold. I like it. I like the idea, the creativity. I would choose like a slightly stronger hand, like King Eight or King Nine, which you wouldn't be too comfortable calling versus say three X or three point five X. So they just block a lot more hands, which will continue. Like let's say he has nine ten suited, he probably continues. If he has nine five suited, he probably folds. So um, I think I would want to have a nine or an eight in my hand. You know, like flop more top pairs. You know, if he does call your free bet, you flop more middle pairs, top pairs, etc. Um, so basically, you're just choosing the top of your folding range with a blocker. Uh, like king eight, king nine. Yeah, uh, he put. Yeah, that's, that's what I would do. Um, obviously folding. Queen ten. We're obviously rising. Calls. We're gonna bet small. I was gonna bet a min bet almost. Yep. He folds. Seems very nice. Uh, thirty two big blinds. Ace two. All right, all right. Right, prepare yourself because you're about to see two really stupid hands. And I know they're mistakes, but I can kind of explain my thinking. It's a very cash game thinking, but prepare yourself for a very stupid hand. That's all I'm saying. So, ace deuce, I would check. 
Uh, I don't want to get shoved on, which you can definitely do. Uh, it's decent to have this hand in check back range. Uh, yeah, check seems good. I did not check. Race seems fine. Like I don't think it's necessarily bad. You know, like uh, maybe he goes for some limp re raises, and then you get to shove over the top. But he limp calls. Very bad board for you. I think he could even he could even have some limps potentially. Um, but then again, yeah, potentially. Uh, you go. You go for, I guess, I'm not sure what you go for. I think I checked behind. Okay. You bet. So I think we obviously have a call here. Uh, yeah. I mean, the, I did consider raising here, but it's like, if you were slightly shorter, very slightly shorter, you could raise then if you, if you jammed, you can call it off. With the, well, the problem is here is that... You know, for the, I was just thinking, like, this is just a bad stack size to raise, so I just didn't call it the other option here. Yeah, the problem is here, if he has an 8 or a 5 or a 4, he usually has some, like, 8, 7, 8, 6, 5, 6, 5, 7, 6, 4 suited kind of hands, like, hands, like, pair plus equity kind of thing, which... Yeah, yeah, yeah. Probably quite sticky. Um, so we call... Rivers right. Jack. Yeah, River. Okay, talk, talk me through it. Right. Based on the way this guy was playing, and how cautious he'd been with top pair in multiple situations, I thought that he did not have a queen here. And I thought he wouldn't have anything worse to. I, I thought if he's value betting, it's better than the queen. And given that I checked the flop, there are infinite bluffs. I actually decided to make a huge hero call here. Um, yeah, he actually flopped the straight at six seven, so I was kind of right. But the, the way this guy had been playing, I just thought there's no way this guy's queen ten. There's just zero chance. It's just so tough to. It's so tough to have a bluff um, because he, he limp called. He limp called, yeah. I guess. Yeah, like he doesn't have like king six offsuit. Yeah. If yeah. he raised pre flop, bet flop, bet turn, bet river, I would be more inclined to call then because it's almost like a scarier board for him to bet into. It's like a tougher board to value bet light into. It's a board where you have a lot of offsuit gut shots like 10 7, king six. Yeah, yeah. Uh, even something like two free suited, which he probably doesn't limp call himself. Um, he did have maybe... a six seven off, which was uh, quite surprising, but I guess uh, he was still calling. So, um, so you called, yeah, kind of a ridiculous hero call. Yeah, flop the straight. So. Uh, I don't think the deuce of spades is that relevant because it, the ace of spades is obviously very good. He never bluffs like ace, ten of spades, or whatever here. Yeah, yeah. But the deuce is very irrelevant because like he's not trying to unblock the deuce of spades, for example. Like if he has, let's say, six deuce of spades for whatever reason, or two free of spades, or king deuce of spades, which is potential, uh, he can definitely bluff these hands because blocking the deuce is not that bad because you don't have the deuce of spades in your your range really that he wants to unblock, you know, like in your turn, like turn spades range, because your nine deuce of spades or your seven deuce of spades, they just bet the flop, you know, to make him fold queen jack off or whatever, you know? So um, the deuce of spades doesn't help that much. The ace of spades is definitely very good. Um, it's nice that you don't have a six or seven in your hand, I think, in terms of yeah, yeah. blocking potential gutters, um, but block no value, which is quite a tough thing. Uh, he has a lot of value combos, like, suited two pairs, straights. Uh, I didn't expect him necessarily to have six, seven offsuit. Um, I would expect him to raise this preflop mostly. Um, but if he starts having all these offsuit two pairs too, then it gets very dicey. Um, yeah, yeah. Again, we want to really, whenever it's going to be close, we want to think about the third guy in the tournament and how that can impact us, you know? Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. I think, again, that's what I was saying. This was just something that was just really not considered enough was the fact that, like, probably shouldn't be even if i thought that call was winning a tiny amount just probably shouldn't be doing it if there's another guy who i don't rate in this so you raise 10 8 offsuit i would definitely fold this hand this is you know there's not many antis out there it's very bad hand they have huge they have huge icm to put on you like this guy can shove really wide on you there's a chance that harry balls just 4x is pre-flop fucking pots the flop and then now suddenly they're essentially like 20 big blinds effective and potentially going to bust. There's just nothing good I think can come from 10-8 off here. 
Um, you don't get to play against Ari in position because you're playing versus small blind rather than raising to his big blind. This big blind will be super sticky because he's so deep. So uh, yeah, there'll be nothing to make me raise this one. What 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 were your thoughts here? I mean, I'm probably not just thinking that deep about stuff, and it's just like literally like this is in my button raising range when we're this shallow stacked. That was probably like the extent of my thoughts, to be honest. Sure, sure. Um, we fold up slate, and we go here. King two off. He's all in for thirteen. Uh, yeah, I would fold. I would fold this one too. We're not going to get it in. Usually, you you want to when when in ICM, if your second card doesn't dominate much, you typically want to play very tight. So, like if you have a hand like say you know King seven, it's so much better than King two because he's going to shove, you know, a lot more like or it performs a lot better. You know, your deuce is just such a bad card to have here. A uh, hand like you know, 9-8 suited or 10-8 suited, I think would perform a lot better than King Deuce here. Um, and I would just fold fold the King Deuce. Still a lot of EV to have left in this tournament, you know, like 13 big blends is fine. You have this guy with 45 who's like partial to give you a double up. You have a good spot to shove onto this guy in Jacko Risha versus his button opens because he can't just, he's going to play his button very aggressively because he's the chip leader, right? So he's going to open yeah. maybe like 80% of buttons into the amateur and the big blind. So you're going to get really good spots to reshove on him with loads of fold equity because you still have enough fold equity of 13 big blinds. So I would just be a little bit more patient, you know, like a bit more respect for your tournament life kind of thing. Yeah, um, that, that was, again, that's just stuff I wasn't really thinking about enough. And I, I thought, I think this is the, this is the even a call in pure chip EV. It's slightly losing. Um, it's a call when you have like 10 big blinds, I think, in pure chip EV. But I, 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 I call it off and we lost. So, rip. You know, I think you play good. You had lots of good thoughts. I think, you know, if you if you combine your like good logical theory thoughts with a bit more patience, um, I think you got, you know, because you good chance, you know. I think uh I think you're definitely gonna be having a good expectation in this field. People won't know you so much, you know, like um you have the advantage that you can read up on a lot of people and get reads on people and speak to friends who've played with people, whereas nobody will you come from a cash game background, right? So they haven't played tournaments with you, which is really good. Um, yeah. yeah, I think you have very good thoughts. Weird, uh, it's a weird field because it's going to be so, like the spectrum of ability is going to be so wide. It's crazy. Yeah, it's a very polarized field for sure. For sure. You have satellite players in from nothing and then like the high stakes regs as well, which is quite good a lot of the time actually because you you kind of knock out that middle ground of players who are really good, really solid. Like a lot of people when you play tournaments, the kind of not break even guys, but like the decent regs to win at say 10, 15% ROI, mm -hmm. those kind of guys take a lot of EV away from the top guys because there's so many of them. But when those guys kind of get eliminated from the field because the buying goes up, it actually helps you as a winning player in the field, um, which is an interesting thing. Yeah, um, I guess a lot, of, a lot of those guys aren't going to bother playing like the phases up to this. So Yeah, exactly, exactly. But yeah, it's been uh, it's been good to talk. Uh, send me another hand history or so over the next week. Uh, well, I'm not sure you're gonna even play any more tournaments or what's your plan for the uh, yeah. Upcoming... I mean, I played I played a few more, but we didn't really make any other deep runs to be honest. Um, it's tough. It's tough to make. We, deep we, I think we about broke even with this third one. Mostly playing sort of twenty two dollars, forty dollars. By we made a couple of min caches and that was a uh, quite a few a few min caches, but um, I think we're about break even. But I'll I'll, I'll play some more for sure. And, uh, That's great. Yeah, That's great. Way. Well, good luck. Thanks for your time. Uh, I'll definitely have your table up watching. Hopefully yeah, you can do the same as uh, Jackie Oliver and uh, have a good run. Um, at, least, at least second to beat that guy. Yeah, exactly. I think uh, everyone watching will be rooting you on rail and hoping that you uh, have some good success. So I'll definitely be watching. I will give you a little bit of a... Uh, a message of who the guys are on your table and you know what they're up to and which guys are the crazy guys which guys are not so uh we'll work it out from that side hopefully you make day two we can do uh do a little video do a little um do some some kind of interview whatever it may be um but yeah just enjoy it i would say you know like you know you seem to play a very fun style aggressive like crazy style don't just play tied to respect you know upon my life or whatever just, I, i'm always like occasionally in my like sort of life when i've played like tournaments just because i've like satellite or got you know some weird like this has happened but i'm playing like, way above my buy-in like I, I end up seeming to play like more 
like risk taking them. <laughs> I don't know if I'm overcompensating. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I I would say go for it. You know, I think if your style, especially if you build a good stack, you know, and it's quite fun in tournaments because if you get to like ten x start and stack, which is not like that ridiculous, like to get to ten x start and stack, mm. like it's not that tough to do. It's like getting you know, you, you double up like three times or whatever, right? If you get to there, you suddenly are playing like a 50k EV stack size, you know, like because in terms of chips, like relative to dollars. Uh, so you suddenly start playing like NL 40k, do you know what I mean? And it's like, okay, well, how, <laughs> how aggressive do I really want to play when I'm playing? I'm raising the button to like 2k or whatever it is, you know, I'm jamming <laughs> for like 35k or I'm playing, you know, 100k EV pot all in against somebody else. So that's when it starts to get really exciting and really fun, I think. Um, yeah. But I'm no, sure, I'm you know, good. I'm sure you're going to do just fine. Sure All right. Do. Well, thanks for your time. And I'll see you next time, hopefully, with a, another deep run. Hopefully, you win this tournament and we do a review of the tournament. And I'm sure it'll be a very fun, a fun one anyway, if you do that. Yeah. Uh, so, yeah, nice one. <laughs>